I've got an hour to talk to you about radiology. And what we're going to do is we're going to have an A to Z of pediatric radiology. A is, of course, for Apple, which I am completely bought into the ecosystem of. <laughs> A is actually for avulsion. Okay? So we see these kids all the time in ED. And they come in um, with pain, um, often after kicking a football or being involved in sporting events. And what we're looking for is the avulsed apophysis here from the anterior superior iliac spine. So that's a nice easy one to start. Um, you can't see the apophysis particularly well on this side, and that's because it's fused appropriately and um, working towards fusion. On this side, it's been pulled off. How about this one? Same story, this side, right-sided pain. This kid's got an anterior inferior iliac spine avulsion. Lucency here between the apophysis and the rest of the pelvis. OK, so those are two nice, easy ones to start with. What about this one, left-sided pain? Where do we think the abnormality is? It's the same as the last one. Inferior um, iliac spine avulsion. That's really tricky to see. And what you need to do, and this is a little learning point here. Sorry? My head's in the way. That's unfortunate. Many people tell me that. Um, right, OK. How's that? That's 30 seconds lost. Anyway, um, the, uh, the way to um, help yourself here is to get another view. And if you get yourself an oblique view, it becomes really easy to see. So ask your radiographers um, if you're concerned about the side of pain, you can't see the, the avulsion injury, ask them to do that oblique view. How about this one? So we can look at the ILAX here. These are normal. They're symmetrical, really helpful. Um, superiors, normal. Inferiors, they look normal. And you can see here, this lucency through here, this is normal. This is a normal apophysis. But down here, we've got a tiny little avulsion injury from the um, inferior ramus. And this is our final one for apophyses. Again, we see these little apophyses of the inferior ramus, but these are symmetrical. These are normal. We see the iliac spine apophysis as well, iliac blade apophysis. And actually, this one had an MR, so we know this was evolved. But this is just to say that sometimes you just can't tell on the x-ray. And if you've got someone who is complaining of continued pain, then low threshold, if you have the ability to get your friendly radiologist to pop them in an MR scanner, because that gives all the answers. B, I wish it was for beer, maybe later. A B is for bowel wall thickening. This is a story of a patient we saw um, a couple of years ago who came in with abdominal distension um, after doing some hiking up north in Scotland. Um, and the story was of some altered bowel habit, abdominal distension, some pain, um, and um, that was about it, really. Um, in the room, uh, we had a bit of a chat, and he was saying that he'd been up hiking. He had drunk from some streams. Um, and as I did the ultrasound, I'm looking at this thinking, these bowel wall loops look really odd. There's also some free fluids sitting in between them as well. So there's bowel wall thickening throughout the whole of the small bowel. There's free fluid as well. I'm thinking infection, especially with the drinking from streams. Um, and I'm thinking inflammation. Could this be some sort of odd enteritis? Um, he came back um, after that weekend for, to, to see the, the pediatricians uh, on the Monday. Still not entirely sure what this, the, um, the underlying diagnosis was. Um, but his symptoms worsened, his abdominal distension worsened. Um, and he got another, MR, uh, another ultrasound a couple of days later, which showed increasing bowel wall thickening, and then an MRI scan. And then if you're not look, used to looking at MRs, there's a T2-weighted sequence. So fluid is bright. So all this bright stuff uh, in here is fluid. All the darker stuff is bowel, and it's all really abnormal. Lots of free fluid, lots of bowel wall thickening, and the most abnormal thing is when we do this sequence, which is our diffusion sequence, it all lights up. And this is a patient with Burkitt's lymphoma of the bowel. Bowel wall thickening, infection, inflammation, 
let's not forget this could be Burkitt's because they don't have any lymphadenopathy at times and this kid didn't have any lymphadenopathy. So that was the diagnosis for him. He's had his treatment, he's doing really well. Um, he's in remission. C. C is for CRMO, which is neither always chronic, reactive, multifocal, or in fact osteomyelitis, so it's a pretty rubbish name. Um, it's a bit of a spectrum of disease. Um, we can see the disease in patients with isolated mandibular swelling, clavicular swelling. It likes the pelvis as well. I'm going to show you a couple of cases. So when you look at this at first, um, look at the, the right side here. Look at the, the outline of the mandible. And then look at the other side. And on this side, it's concave. On this side, it's convex. And then as we look a bit closer, uh, we see there's some periosteal reaction as well. And actually, the more we look, the more we realize this mandible is really abnormal. Again, MR gives us the answer um, and hopefully um, helps us to work out what's going on. This is the mandible on the normal side. Um, black lines of cortex, a little bit of medullary cavity on the middle. Um, this is the mandible on the abnormal side. Enlarged, expanded, lots of inflammatory change. Um, I've spent a couple of years now rescuing these patients from orthopedics because they've got a bone problem and realigning their care to rheumatology, which is where they should go. This next patient um, was under the orthopods with clavicular pain. And with the retrospectoscope, you can look at these medial heads of clavicles and recognize that this one is bigger. Um, it's easy on the MRI because... It's really much bigger, and there's all this inflammatory change around about it. This patient was under the care of the orthopods, and they were talking about what they were going to do to improve her symptoms, because she was really sore. Um, they talked about doing operations, more biopsies, to see if there was um, it, what the underlying cause was. Um, and what we did was we realigned her care to the rheumatologists. Um, and while you can improve the inflammatory change with the um, permidronate that they get, you can't change the bony expansion, which by this point um, is huge. You can switch off their inflammatory change, though. And here on the follow-up MR, there's no inflammatory change around that clavicle. The bone can decrease in size a little, um, but not a lot. So these patients with CRMO um, need to get to a rheumatologist or a pediatrician with a rheumatology interest to get the right treatment rather than malingering under the orthopedic service. Um, where an operation isn't going to help them. And this is a tricky one. Um, anyone see where the abnormality is? Inferior putre ramus down here. Yeah, look at that. Asymmetry of the synchondrosis, uh, ischiopubic synchondrosis. That can be normal sometimes, but not with this lucency um, and this irregular outline. So actually, I thought this was infection. Um, and we did um, get the MRI, which showed us lots of inflammation around the bone, bone edema as well, and expansion, um, but two biopsies, negative, no infective signs or symptoms. This uh, was CRMO, and actually with pomidronate, um, she made um, a, a marked recovery um, in terms of her symptoms. The other thing with CRMO is looking for the other lesions, because oftentimes it is multifocal, so MRI of whole body and spine. Moving on to D. D is for double bubble. Um, stomach bubble here, duodenal bubble in this neonate. And we know it's a neonate because we've got some umbilical uh, lines in. Um, double bubble, we always think of duodenal atresia, but actually it can be any sign, uh, any cause of duodenal obstruction. So just because you've got a double bubble, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's duodenal atresia. It could actually be volvulus causing double bubble. And then we've got some other examples here of upper small bowel obstruction. Um, you can see that there's really marked um, uh, bowel um, gas distension um, with no gas elsewhere in the abdomen. So stomach, you can follow it all the way around here through duodenum, and it kind of gets towards the DJ flexure, and that's about it, really. Uh, and this was jejunal atresia. And this one, this is where the ileal atresia was. So where you see bowel gas distension, 
bowel dissension with gaseous contents. And it's really marked like this, um, especially towards the top, with nothing distal. Think atresia as a cause. E. E is my favourite joint, the elbow. Um, I like the elbow because it's quite tricky sometimes. Um, sometimes, though, it's really easy, isn't it? Um, the child comes in after they've fallen off the playground equipment or whatever, they've got a deformed elbow, they get their x-ray, and they've got a dorsally displaced supracondylar fracture. Easy peasy. Sometimes, though, it's not quite so easy, especially in the younger ones. We like to think of effusions of raised fat pads that are really easy to see, and sometimes this is all you see. This kind of slightly reduced density um, dorsally um, and anterior to the joint as well. Anterior humeral line isn't helping us. Um, there's no dorsal displacement. We're going to check everything else as well. Electron on, radial neck, radial alignment. We're not going to find anything. So these are the non-displaced supracondylar fractures, and the effusion is the thing that's going to help you. Supracondylar fractures are slightly different, though, to lateral condyle fractures, and these are really important. Um, and they're important because they can displace really easily, and they tend to swing back dorsally um, in displacement. And so your friendly orthopedic surgeon will want to put a screw in this because there's too much displacement between the fracture and the rest of the bone. They can be really obvious, like that last one. Sometimes they can be really subtle. Um, and it's important to remember that these fractures aren't just this tiny little piece of bone. These fractures are actually a big bit of cartilage with the capitate and that little bit of bone. Uh, and so these tend to displace dorsally, and what you need um, when they are um, displaced is for them to be fixed orthopedically. So we've looked at supracondylar fractures, we've kind of uh, invoked a bit of alignment stuff, we've talked a bit about effusion. Um, the other thing in the elbow is, of course, critol. Capitellum, radio head, oh, internal epicondyle, trochlea, olecranon, and lateral. Except that isn't the trochlea, is it? That's the medial epicondyle that's been evolved and is sitting in the joint in a um, funky position because the trochlea is up here. Most of these medial epicondyles get pulled off um, medially and sit out with the joint. Um, and the orthopedic surgeons don't really want to do anything with them. Um, but if they've ended up in the joint, um, then they need to be gone and fished out. And that brings us, I think, to our last elbow case. Um, and we've got an effusion. We can see definitely a fat pad out the back. We've got some elevation of the fat pad out the front as well. So my heckles are up. There's definitely something going on here, so I need to go and find it. Um, I don't think it's a supracondylar fracture. We're going to look here. doesn't look like it's a lateral condyle fracture. So I'm going to go to my next place, which is the radial neck. And there's a tiny little change in angulation here at the radial neck. I'm a bit suspicious for that. And then I go to my next place, which is the olecranon, because there's a tiny little fracture through here. The olecranon fractures are the ones that we miss the most, I think. Um, and you can see it here on the AP. So once you've gone around the elbow and you've looked at all your big hitters, um, remember the radial neck, the little radial neck fracture there, um, and also the olecranon as places to go looking for the fracture causing the effusion. And remember, they're not always right when they put stars in the film, but often they are. <laughs> and the best thing to do is to phone them up and say, why did you put the star on that film? Because I can't see what's going wrong what I do. Um, F is for SpongeBob SquarePants, who seems to be diving down an esophagus. Uh, and he's stuck where foreign bodies tend to get stuck, isn't it? Just near the aortic arch. Um, we usually see coins, though, um, stuck at the top there. Um, when they are on fast, you know that they are in the esophagus. We can prove that on a lateral if we were to do that, but we don't need to. Um, we can see it just because it's on fast. The important thing to do, though, is recognize these ones, where there's a little lucency um, around the inside, because it's a button battery. That's not good, is it? Um, 
These obviously need to come out even if they've passed um, down into stomach. This is a Mickey Mouse pendant. No, it's not. It's a magnet stuck together that looked like Mickey Mouse. Um, and this is a line of magnets in bow, except they're not in one loop of bow. They're not in two loops of bow. They're in three loops of bow, um, subsequently causing perforation. So remember, when you see magnets lined up, it, they don't necessarily sit in the same loop of bow. G for gonads. Um, and I've put this example here just because it's quite interesting. This child presented with left-sided godanal pain. Left, obviously, in radiology is right and right is left. Um, so as well as left-sided pain, he's also got right-sided swelling because he's got a hydrocele. Um, there's also little areas of increased echogenicity in this testicle because he's got testicular microlithiasis as well. Um, see these down the outside? Um, but the important thing is when we um, scroll down to look at Doppler signal, the one with the hydrocele has got Doppler signal in it. The one without the hydrocele doesn't. Okay, so Doppler can sometimes be helpful to identify torsion, but we know that it's not always. So you will definitely get cases where you have torsion, detorsion, and then either normal vascularity or hypervascularity in your detorted testicle. Um, and that doesn't mean the testicle is all right, and oftentimes they're not. Same is true for ovaries. So ultrasound may be helpful, but realistically, if you're concerned about torsion, either of an ovary or of a testicle especially, um, usually the testicles need to be explored. And this one is just for fun, really. Um, this is a neonate, a one-day-old, who was asked to go on ultrasound um, with right-sided groin swelling. Um, and I put the probe on, um, and I'll just orientate you here. There's a um, cystic structure um, sitting in here. There's a bit of fluid and some solid material, um, and that's just in the groin. Just probe over the lump in the groin. What on earth is that, I thought? It looks like an ovary. Can't be an ovary, can it? And so I kept scanning, and it looked more and more like an ovary with some solid material around the outside and then multiple cysts. And then in the neck of the... Um, hernia, I found this, which is the uterus of the neonate, which was um, in the hernial neck. So this child had um, an ovary, a fallopian tube, and a uterus in their hernia. Um, and then the next day, um, I was editing through some of the Radiopedia uploads, and my old boss in Melbourne uploaded almost the identical case. So this is horribly rare um, for an inguinal lump in a neonate, but it does happen. So another one to just keep tickling at the back of your mind there. H is for the hyperlucent hemithorax. And so this child um, is three months old, and they've got a progressive set of x-rays where this hemithorax has got bigger and bigger over time. It was a bit big when they were born, and now it's bigger and now he's starting to get symptoms. His NG tube should be a bit further on, but he's obviously got this big, expanded, hyperlucent hemithorax, diaphragms down, mediastinum's across. And with the progressive history, we're thinking congenital lobar overinflation as our cause. Okay? This child also has the same story. Um, slightly older, um, but over time they've had this progressive increase in the size of this area of lucency. So it's not the whole lung like the last one, it's just this area here. And so because of that and the mediastinal shift, we're thinking, well, this is probably congenital lobar overinflation again, and so we do it in CT. Um, and it shows us just how much we underestimate things on x-rays, because this is all his middle lobe, which is just nuts. Um, so axially, this is all middle lobe. This is heart and mediastinum shifted over. Um, as we come down to the bottom, we can see this is lower lobe, compressed and atelectatic. As we come up to the top, we'll see that the upper lobe is compressed and atelectatic as well. And the left side, there really isn't very much gas exchange going on in these lungs. Um, the one that looks really good isn't working at all because gas is only getting in and, and not out. So this child had a right middle lobectomy and that was confirmed as his diagnosis. And CLO essentially happens because gas is getting in but not getting out. It's a ball and valve effect, um, oftentimes because of a slightly abnormal um, 
bronchus that gets pinched and allows air in but not out. You're not going to get fooled by this one, though, because this child presented, after playing in the garden, acutely breathless. So we know that this isn't CLO. This is going to be an inhaled foreign body, surely. Um, again, a left-sided, big hemithorax. They're a bit rotated, um, but it's definitely um, more hyperlucent than the other side. The other thing to look at, and this is a really good trick, is to look at the rib spaces. Look at the distance between the rib spaces here and the spaces on this side. Yeah, where you see rib space indifference, that's often down to a difference in volume. So in our institution, this child would just go to theatre and they'd have a look. Where I worked before in Melbourne, um, the protocol was to do lateral decubitus for these patients. You lie them on their side, the lung at the bottom um, collapses a little bit, you flip them over and you, oh, you find the stone wedged in their left main bronchus and the lung that hasn't deflated as the other one did. So that can be a useful test if you don't have the opportunity to get the patient to theatre for someone to have a look down with a rigid bronch. Um, and the reason it works is that you should get some aselectasis dependently. Um, and when you put them on the side of the obstruction, the air can't get back out again. It's stuck um, because of that um, obstructing foreign body. This one, this is a three-month history of some breathlessness. It's the same story again, isn't it? Um, and this child got a CT. And this isn't congenital lobar overinflation. This is peanut-related overinflation because the peanut's here in the left main bronchus. So they don't always present acutely. Um, if the story doesn't fit, do a better test. I is for interception. Uh, interception, plain films are really rubbish for interception. Um, I recognise that some of you might work in places where you don't have access to ultrasound overnight and out of hours, um, but it's not a great test because what you really want to do is look for the concentric rings here of the small bowel on the inside and large bowel on the outside. There's a bit of free fluid in there as well. And what we want to do here is reduce this, and this is a left paracolic gutter view of the interception. So this bowel has gone all the way from cecum, all the way around the bowel, uh, ascending, transverse, and then descending, and is sitting somewhere in descending colon. We have one in Melbourne where it actually got all the way out of anus, um, which was interesting. Um, and what we want to do here is to reduce it with some air. So a catheter up the bottom, some surgical hands, because they're really good at holding bottoms, um, to pinch hole um, everything, and then increase the pressure to about 120 mils of mercury. Um, and you can see here, this is the interception, and as we go through, it gets pushed up the descending colon, and then back across transverse, back across transverse, <coughs> and it keeps going until we get to ascending colon, and then into cecum. So air reduction is a great thing. It's pretty distressing for the child and the parents. It's pretty depressed, distressing for the radiologist as well. Um, there's about a 10% chance that if it does work, they might recur, and there's about a 1% chance that you're going to perforate um, the colon while you do it. Um, and they're going to have to go to theatre anyway, so that 1% risk is better than a 100% chance of them going to theatre. If they've got a lead point as the cause, uh, you're less likely to be able to get it back, um, and the likelihood of perforation increases as well. J. J is for JAA. And the reason I put this in is really as a plea. Um, if you think that there's inflammation going on, let us know, because we'll do a different test. <coughs> so here, this is a, we've seen a couple of these already, a fluid sensitive, so that means fluid is bright. Fat suppressed, which means fat is dark, sequence. So there's all this fluid and inflammation in the knee joint. And I'll orientate you. This is patella, um, and this is tibial plateau. If you just say swollen knee, some trauma, then we're almost certainly just going to do a normal knee MR. If you say, I think there might be JAA, or there's something inflammatory going on, or I don't really know what's happening, then we're more likely to give contrast. And the reason that's important is that on the contrast-enhanced scan, we see the, the fluid is dark, and this is all synovitis. So you cannot tell on the non-enhanced scan um, 
that that is synovium and fluid? You can only tell that once you give contrast. Contrast also helps us looking for tina synovitis, which is going to change their management. Um, and it also helps us looking um, for enthesitis as well. So if you think inflammation is happening and the joint is inflamed um, and maybe JAA is in your differential, mention that on the request and we'll do a different scan. K is for dextrocardia. Hmm. Let's just, it, first thing to do when you see this film is say, actually, is this definitely round the right way? Has someone got confused here? Um, but you check with the radiographer and they say, no, no, it's definitely round the right way. Um, and they've got a right-sided arch, a right-sided heart, a right-sided apex. The left hemidiaphragm is higher than the right. So as well as dextrocardia, um, they've got situs inversus. Um, and then you think, this is in a K section of an A to Z. This must be something with an abnormal lung as well, because this is cartagenous syndrome um, with dextrocarda, situs inversus, and abnormal lungs, because they've got little ring shadows down here. The CT scan gives us the answer, though, because there's ring shadows, there's nodules. Um, as we suspected from the plain film, there's dextrocardia. If we go all the way down, the spleen's on this side, the liver's on this side, which is the wrong way round. So situs inversus, dextrocardia, bronchiectasis, all add up to cartagenous syndrome. Had to get a Lego in there somewhere. But L is for the lucent bone lesion. We don't do very many skulls these days, do we? But when we do, because of a lump on the head, minor trauma, Where's the lesion here? Which side is it on? Right. OK, it's much easier on the other ones, isn't it? Which is why I showed the first one first. Um, so there's this big lucent lesion here, which we can see here. Um, and when we get it on the side view here, we can see that there's an internal and an external portion to it. Um, so this, radiologically, is almost certainly Langerhans cell histiocytosis. It used to be called eosinophilic granuloma. LCH um, can be monoostotic, it can be polyostotic, it can be multi-system. So once we've got a picture like this where we think there's a diagnosis of LCH, they need to have staging, um, either by a skeletal survey or MR. And we're looking for bony abnormality, for spine abnormality, for brain abnormality. If it's a single lesion, um, they actually often get better just after their biopsy. So this is the MRI um, before biopsy, and we see this big soft tissue mass that's eroded through the calvarium. There's some dural enhancement as well underlying it. But these often just get a biopsy, and then no treatment, and they go away, which is nuts. Um, if they've got multiple lesions, then they'll get some chemotherapy. Um, and if they've got multi-system disease, then that, again, puts them into a higher risk category. The problem is, in radiology, that the same disease looks different in different places, which is really frustrating, because this is also LCH. Um, and it looks completely different than it does in the skull. In the skull, it was this nice, well-circumscribed, lucent lesion. Here, we've got this really wide zone of transition. Normal bone here abnormal bit down here, but where does the abnormal bit start? don't really know. It's also got this really aggressive looking periosteal reaction. Um, so this would fall into the aggressive bone lesion camp. You'd be thinking Ewing sarcoma, osteosarcoma, um, and then LCH goes in that list as well, and that's what this child has. Again, MRI really highlights that laminated periosteal reaction going around in concentric circles around the bone and the inflammatory change around about it. Again, these require um, bone biopsy at your sort of local regional uh, tumor service. And I'm going to come back to another tricky pelvis again. Um, it's not this. This is actually, in this child, normal. And this is just the asymmetric ischiopubic synchondrosis. It's actually this because this isn't the sequel pole. This is the sequel pole. 
the sequel pole should not be down here. This isn't a bow gas pattern. Um, this is their LCH lesion. It's just worth thinking about when you look at um, x-rays of pelvis and you see bow gas pattern. Just remind yourself, where does that sequel pole tend to happen? It never happens down here. You never see bow gas pattern down here. Um, and we've seen a couple of um, cases where they've had tricky looking loosened bone lesions that have initially been thought of as bow gas pattern. Um, but you never get bow gas down here. We had one down here um, um, in another case where there was lucency above the acetabular margin. You don't get bow um, hanging around there so laterally. The MRI again just confirms this is the solitary bone lesion with lots of edema around about it and some periosteal reaction. M, and we're nearly halfway. Pretty much on time as well. Um, M is for mimics. Um, so I put together a couple here. Neutron foramina are a really good mimic because they look really fracture-like, don't they? They come from the outside to the inside, but they don't usually go all the way through. Um, so when you're seeing a lucent line through a cortex, think to yourself, could that be a neutron foramen? Um, is there any soft tissue swelling around about it? Are they sore there? Um, does it go all the way through the bone? Bipartite bones, swines. Um, sesamoids, patella, some ossicles. Um, when they're bipartite, you tend to have a nice, smooth, and well-corticated margin, unlike this one, which is a fractured sesamoid. Um, it should be nice and round, and instead we've got this lucent lesion, lucent line going through the middle. Fracture mimics um, include um, odd physes, especially in the shoulder, um, but also the greater trochanter here. Once you've seen lots of pelvises in young children or adolescents, it all becomes a normal um, matching game. Um, and we all recognize this as normal. But if you haven't seen very many, this can start to look a bit odd. It looks like there's a fracture going all the way through here. It's the normal physis of the greater trochanter apophysis. Um, and then we have um, some accessory ossicles that hang around in all sorts of funny places. And if you head over to Radiopedia, you can um, have a look at pretty much any of them um, as examples of um, normal ossicles uh, that can mimic fractures. And then this failure of fusion, really tricky on the CT scan. Um, but again, look for the cortex, look for the corticated margin next to the lucency. How's everyone doing? Nods. From some people, slumps from others. It's like an MDT. Um, N um, is for NAI, um, which is unfortunately part of my job, and um, quite a big part of our jobs. Um, sometimes we have patients who present with fractures like this, but actually not that often. Um, a metaphyseal corner fracture, which is what this is, sitting here on the corner of the metaphysis, and when viewed at obliquely, um, it looks like a bucket handle and therefore also has the name bucket handle fracture. Um, they're highly specific for NAI, but actually we don't see them very often. What we're probably more likely to see is the spiral diaphyseal femoral fracture in the non-weight bearing or the non-ambulant child. And when you see that in the non-ambulant child, you've got to think about, does the story that's been given me match that? That's a really strong bone. That doesn't just um, twist off itself. Sometimes you'll get the bronchiolytic patient or the wheezy child come in um, by parents, um, and you'll get this sort of appearance here with these big round areas over the ribs. These are healing rib fractures. How many do you see? Two? More? Three, four, five, six, seven, <coughs> eight, nine, ten, eleven. Um, so you need to be on your guard to make sure you're always thinking about rib fractures. And they can be really subtle. 
Um, but sometimes when you find them, you then go on and do the rest of the skeletal survey in the CT head, and you find acute blood uh, in the subdural spaces. So bright blood on CT is acute blood less than 7 to 10 days. What about this one? This is really hard. There's a tiny fracture through here and through this one as well. It might not project very well, um, but there are fractures there. Um, and it's really important we pick these up. It's really important when you look at the chest x-rays um, of these kids that you see in the ED or in the paediatric ward that you look at their chest x-rays. Um, and you look at them carefully, um, and you look at the ribs specifically. Um, we had a, a, a case not that long ago, which was a, actually an orthopedic follow-up film of a humeral fracture. Um, and actually there were rib fractures on the edge of the humeral film, um, which weren't picked up by the, the orthopedic doctors. They weren't looking for that. Um, and these weren't second read in the hospital uh, where, where it was happened. Um, and their sibling um, was admitted six months later with a catastrophic head injury. It's super important that we find these because these kids need to be in a place of safety um, and it's our job to make sure that they get there. And what happens once you've found that um, rib fracture? Well, the child ends up um, with a skeletal survey, about 25 pictures of every bone. Uh, it takes about an hour and a half by two radiographers who are trained to do that. So we don't do these out of hours, we don't do it at the weekend, and there's a reason for that. They need to do, be done properly. There's usually a nurse that comes with them as well to be a witness, um, as well as the parent or guardian. Um, it's an absolute beast to go through these and uh, report them, um, looking you know, for the minute uh, detail. In the under ones, they also get a CT scan of the head, and that's looking for, again, acute hemorrhage like we saw in that last case. Um, there's one here. And if um, you find either an abnormality on the CT or they have neurology or they're encephalopathic, they end up with an MR brain and spine as well. And this is just to highlight how little we see on X-ray, uh, on CT, sorry. So there's a little bit of acute blood here, but actually the rest of the scan is pretty blameless. CT is a screening test because these are two massive subdural hemorrhages. This bit here, this dark bit, is normal CSF. So all this grey is a big subdural on both sides. Um, and this was a little bit of subarachnoid blood, not subdural. So low threshold for going for a better test. Do you remember this case? It's got a rib fracture. So it's not always the child who mum thinks isn't quite right, who comes in, has a normal chest x-ray apart from the rib fractures. It's the children that have other pathology um, that are causing them not to sleep and to be distressed that just takes the parents to the edge and over it. O for oranges. O is for osteochondral defect. Um, this is... Um, this is my son, um, who couldn't straighten his leg for a couple of months, um, and finally got some imaging, which showed this massive osteochondral defect. He didn't have any pain, um, he just couldn't get the last 10 degrees um, of leg straightening. That was instructive for me. Um, it's huge. Um, and the important thing here is the recognition that what we need to do for these patients is make sure they get an orthopedic surgeon before it delaminates. Yeah? So the bone underneath the cartilage here is like scrambled eggs. It's soft. It's not going to heal on its own. And it needs some help. Um, so the first thing to do is uh, an MRI. Um, and the funny story here is that we were driving home one day. I got a phone call from our RDA, who was making the MRI booking, she said, hi, can I speak to Nathan's dad, please? I'm like, Sharon, it's me. She's like, Jeremy, what are you doing on the phone? Get off the phone, I was trying to speak to someone's dad. <laughs> Sharon, it's my son. <laughs> oh. Um, and the MRI is really helpful, and the reason it's helpful, it confirms what we're looking at is an osteochondral defect. But it also um, 
confirms that the cartilage over the top is intact. That's super important. Um, we look for fissuring, fluid escaping into that bone that's not particularly uh, well, um, and then that leads to delamination and uh, loose fragments. And what the orthopods will do is they'll, they'll do an arthroscopy and they'll look at the cartilage, and the cartilage looks pristine. Um, and then what they'll do is they'll drill into the cartilage, into the dead bone, and then into the bone that's underneath it to promote healing. Um, so osteochondral defects are this kind of group of um, conditions that go from tiny lesions we do nothing about, and they heal on their own, to these bigger lesions that haven't quite yet um, delaminated that we need to do something about, and the orthopod can do that. The ones that have a flap where they'll actually put in a dissolvable plastic screw to fix the cartilage back on again to the ones that have actually um, fallen apart where there are loose bodies. So MRI is going to be the, the test um, that helps us make that decision. Um, but it's just instructive that these kids can present with pretty minor symptoms and sometimes no pain. He's doing well on his crutches. P is for pneumonia. This little girl um, came to us a couple of weeks ago um, with pneumonia. She's got middle lobe and lower lobe involvement. She's got consolidation. She didn't do particularly well on her initial treatment. She got more breathless, required more oxygen, ended up with a big effusion. So she came to our place. Um, of course, she arrived at 10 o'clock at night. Um, so uh, she wasn't quite as well as had it been expected when she arrived. Um, so I came in and did um, an ultrasound, which showed a big effusion. The lung is now completely collapsed. This is mediastinum and this is lung. Um, and as we roll through here, we can see lots of septations, lots of echogenic material. This is liver, lots of echogenic material again, collapsed lung. Uh, the important thing here, though, is that there's this big bit in the middle that is um, hypoechoic. This is lung necrosis. Okay? So our respiratory physicians, what they really want to do is put a drain in and then give them urokinase to get rid of all of that septation. When you've got lung necrosis, that's probably not such a great idea. Um, I think the evidence base is poor, but the concern is that you could then create a bronchopleural fistula um, if you get rid of the fibrin that might be holding the side of the lung together. So she gets a drain. She drains some and then she gets a CT. And the CT really is to confirm whether or not that was lung necrosis. So we give contrast. And as we come down, we can see that there has been some lung re-expansion, but there's still quite a bit of fluid there. There's some enhancing um, collapsed lung. And then down here in the middle lobe, actually, there's lots of non-enhancing lung. So this is all lung necrosis. As we come down a bit further, there's a slightly more rounded bit and you start to worry that that might be a developing lung abscess. Um, we repositioned her drain. Um, she drained a lot more fluid off. She continued on her IVs, and actually she got better. Um, so this wasn't a lung abscess. It's very difficult to tell the difference on the CT. The likelihood is that these kids who have nasty infections, nasty paranormonic infected uh, collections, um, and lung necrosis actually do really well. The lung's amazing. Um, it regenerates, they probably will have normal lung function and their imaging will be almost normal. R. R is for the radius. We do a lot of these x-rays in our place for kids who um, are, it hurts there somewhere. Um, so it's, it's a kind of an odd exam where you have an AP of the wrist and a lateral of the elbow and then opposite on the other one. But we can see that there's definitely a radial neck fracture. What you can't see and you won't see unless you do a dedicated view is the fact that the radial head isn't where it should be. Let's look at that again. We're not calling that on this view. We're probably not calling it on that view. You draw a line down there, it's going through capitellum. So if you've got a radial neck fracture, I think we've got to be thinking about doing APs of our elbows um, to check where that radial head is. Because if you draw a line down here, it's out there somewhere. You need a big orthopedic thumb on that. Push it back in again. Under anesthesia. <laughs> Sometimes radial neck fractures can be a bit odd. This one's flipped round and the fractured bit's trying to uh, play with the capitellum. 
Um, and then sometimes, and um, this is where all the lines in the cheese um, line up, um, something like this could get missed. This actually one wasn't missed, but we um, have, uh, I've certainly seen ones that have been missed. And you look at that and you think, there's no way that anyone could miss that. This radius is like nowhere near the capitellum. Draw a line down here and it's, you know, it's in midair. You know yourself though, what happens? You're in the middle of looking at it, you've looked at one view, someone knocks you on the shoulder and says, can you look at this sick patient? You go and look at them, you come back. I've looked at the x-ray, it's fine. We've just got to be really careful um, that we check the alignment um, because when these remain out, even if it's for a short period of time, they're really difficult to get back in. They end up having to have ulnar osteotomies and all sorts to try and get the radio head back in again. S. Salter Harris, we all know about this, don't we? Um, one is just a slip. Two has this little bit of a metaphysis with it. Three is just the epiphysis. Four is through. And five is rammed. And we never find the fives at the time. They present later when they've got growth restriction. This is a great x-ray, because you show this to juniors, and they're like, yeah, it looks normal. Um, <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> the epiphysis is right the way out here, and the metaphysis is there. That's weird. Um, so this is essentially a, a child's shoulder dislocation, because the weak part is their physis. Yauchi. Um, this is a tricky Soltaris type 2, because the fracture's down here, um, just mirroring the posterior portion of the fibula. Look, though, there's lots of soft tissue swelling, and also the um, front of that physis is wide as well. So this is a Soltaris 2 in and out the physis. Hands, I hate hand x-rays. There's so much to look at. It's a right pain in the backside. But there he is, Soltaris 3. And then ankles in the slightly older child, again, probably playing football. It's got a triplane fracture. Look at this big fracture down through the metaphysis. Extends down through the epiphysis. These kids, um, I think, uh, have a low threshold for doing CT on because these injuries are really complex and it's really helpful to have a good idea of what's actually going on before the orthopod goes and sticks some screws in them. T is for tubes. In the right place or not in the right place? Not in the right place, because this is the trachea here. That's the trachea, because there's Carina, and also the child's looking to the right, so the trachea must be in front. This is in the esophagus. These ones are easier, though, aren't they? Big looped NG tube in a child with esophageal atresia. There must be some distal connection, though, because there's some bowel gas. Makes you look clever in front of the surgeons. Um, an NG tube not in the right place. But we'll keep pushing it. We'll keep pushing it. <laughs> so we've got some in the left main bronchus here, looped around over the carina and then down to right main bronchus. And then here we can have the NG tube is helping us to tell us what's going on. Because there's a big back gas bubble here. There's a nice diaphragm on the right, but there's no diaphragm on the left. Hmm. Um, and then we look at the umbilical um, lines, and we've got an umbilical artery catheter in the midline going to where it should be, and then this umbilical vein catheter, which has got um, malposition down the left portal vein um, because the liver is also up in this diaphragmatic hernia. It's quite cute, isn't it? And that brings us nicely onto you. Two arteries and one vein in these bad boys. Um, it used to take me ages to work out which was which. Now, does the umbilical artery catheter go down, or does the vein catheter go down? Uh, and you just remember, one vein, two arteries, and the two arteries are attached to the iliacs. So it's the artery um, that dips down into the pelvis, attaches to iliac, and then comes back up the aorta. And the vein catheter um, just heads straight up and should sit um, across the portal confluence um, at the inferior cava atrial junction. This is a bit like that last one. Uh, we saw where the UVC is heading off down the left-hand side rather than heading straight on at the crossroads. Here, 
UVC slightly too far across either their ASD or their PFO. And here, their UAC, way, crikey, into, I think, probably a carotid. <laughs> v. V is for vesoureteric junction, uh, a reflux, sorry. Um, so we've got a dilated kidney here, and there are a couple of causes, aren't there? Um, this could be um, a PUJO, so a high obstruction at the pelvic junction. It could be a um, vesicoteric, vesicoureteric junction obstruction, rarer in children, but not unheard of. Um, or if this was a boy and it was on both sides, this could be posterior ureteral valves. Could just be reflux, though. Um, so an MCU is a really helpful test to kind of iron out some of that stuff. We fill the bladder. They start to pee. They reflux up um, into the ureters and then upper tracts. Um, and then they wee out some of that contrast. So we've got grade four um, reflux here. Matt Skowski, who is a legend of a radiologist and illustrator, um, has got some beautiful pictures um, of these. So again, we're kind of in grade four here with a dilated ureter, dilated upper tract, some blunting, but not um, complete loss of the fornices. Um, we had a kitty who presented a boy bilateral <coughs> upper tract dilatation, day zero in the borders near us, um, 24th of December. <laughs> okay, is he peeing yet? He hasn't peed yet. Oh, I'm thinking Christmas day bilateral nephrostomies on a day zero. That doesn't sound like a great way to send Christmas. Fortunately, he did pee. Um, and when we came to do his MCU, really difficult to get the catheter into bladder. So it went into penis fine, but really tricky to get into bladder. Uh, in fact, it was a strong surgical arm <coughs> that got it in. Um, and as I started to put contrast in, this contrast seemed to wash around a circular structure. And I thought, oh my gosh, we're in perineum. Um, but it wasn't. It was actually just outlining the huge urethraceal that was flopping down and causing bladder outflow obstruction. So it's not only posterior urethral valves that cause bladder outlet obstruction. Other things can too. W is for what the f... <laughs> what is that? Well, it's bright, so it's metal. It's pointy. Any ideas? A knife, okay. Javelin. Um, th this bit's the same. It's also pointy. They come together... Don't let your six-year-old run with scissors. What did the neurosurgeons do? They went, mm. <laughs> Didn't bleed, didn't leak. Excellent. Um, and what's amazing is six months later, she's got um, some changes on her MR um, with a little bit of a tract where the scissors were. She's got no neurological deficit. Absolutely phenomenal. Um, she does have some gliosis, so she, you know, she's got a risk of seizures in the future, but... And we got to W and I was struggling for W and I got to X and I thought, oh my gosh, what am I going to do for X? So I'm putting X and Y together to give us haemophilia. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, haemophilia does two things. One, it gets blood in the joints and you get destroyed joints. This does not look right. There's um, joint destruction, thinning, um, and just general irregularity and nastiness. Uh, you, yeah, it's just horrible, isn't it? Um, big joint effusion as well. And the other thing they get is deep-seated muscle um, bleeds as well. And these are really tricky to see at ultrasound if they're deep. Um, and so MR sometimes is a thing we need to do. So this is a big uh, hematoma, three months on treatment, or a month, sorry, later. Uh, it's not getting better because he's not doing what he's been told to do, which is rest. Um, but with some rest um, and continued factor, he uh, slowly uh, resorbs his hematoma, which eventually goes away. So sometimes we need to use MR for those deep-seated muscle hematomas. Z for zebra lines, and we're pretty close to the end. Um, zebra lines here, growth arrest lines. These aren't in normal bones, though. These are in wibbly-wobbly bones of osteogenesis, because this is pomidronate therapy. 
So cyclical primogenate, you get a dense line of normal bone, and then all the other bone is abnormal. And you can also use it in osteopetrosis. So that is us at the end of a rather rapid A to Z of radiology and peds. Um, did you miss, though? Did you notice, though, I missed out Q? Have we got time for a quiz? What, what's next? Is it T? We've got time for a quick quiz. Yeah? Right. Get your phone. Go to kahoot.it. I should have plugged in this audio. You get this really crazy. This is meant for school children. So if you go to kahoot.it and then put in that game pin and then start to put your name in, you don't have to use your own name. You're just not allowed to use naughty ones. And so the way this works is I'm going to show you a picture um, and there are four options. Your phone will change to have those four coloured options and you have to press the coloured option that best matches the diagnosis. Scary spice. Just to add a little bit of um, fun to it, the faster you get your result, the more points you get. Mm, right. So I'm going to give us a couple of seconds, two, 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 two. We might need that in a minute. Are there really 100 people in here? Crikey. Right, so we're going to start. We are going to start. I've got a tester for you first. This hasn't got any points. So if you muck up at the start, it doesn't matter. This is just to show you how it works. Okay. Are you ready? Question coming. The question is, where is the central line tip? Here comes the picture. So we've got answers coming in. We've got 10 seconds to go. This is against the clock. Oh, we've got people standing up at the back. That's clever. So, subclavian vein. Yes, it was. Let's show us. Here it is, down here, round the corner, subclavian. Scary Spice isn't, well, would have been in the lead, but no points available. So a 1,000 points, um, the quicker you go, all the way down to zero. Okay, so what is the cause of bowel displacement? Likely cause, consistent with. split. It was the bladder. It's just a bladder. This is just a bladder that's extended up out of pelvis. It's quite a pointy one, um, but that's all it is. And this is a neonate, yeah, umbilical clip there. Ooh, someone was in there speedy, weren't they? Right, what is fractured? Is there a condylar fracture, an epicondylar fracture? Is the electronon fractured? Is there a radial neck fracture? Ooh. Someone just couldn't make a decision there at the end. Oh, I don't know what it is. So the soft tissue swelling and this epicondyle, this should always overlie uh, the bone. So it's been pulled off. It's not the epicondylar fracture that ends up in the joint. It's the one that's just been pulled off. Um, so conservative treatment for those guys. Oh, DDM. Right-sided pain after trauma. Synchondrisis isn't normal or is prominent. Is this inflammation? Is it infection? Do you think it's normal or is there a tumour? 
What do you reckon? Right-sided pain, remember? Um, so, yeah, it, I, I've showed you a couple of these, um, which are normal. Uh, I've shown you one that was inflammation and one that was infection, and then I showed you a kind of a tumory one that was up here. It can be all sorts. If you've got a left-sided asymmetric ischiopubic synchondrosis on the side of pain, get a better test. Um, ask for an MR, because that's going to help you out. Jace. MCG and Frank. Oh, it's quite, quite close at the top. Which Salter Harris is this? Is it a one? Is it a two? Is it a three? Or is it a four? Oh, interesting. Split. So the epiphysis here has been pushed off. This is the metaphysis of the distal radius. And there's a bit of bone out here at the back. Um, so this is a Saltaris type 2 fracture. Last one, and then it's tea time. What is this foreign body? Is it a battery? Is it a button? Is it a coin, or is it some weird popper? Mainly in there because I couldn't think of a fourth one. <laughs> Don't choose green. Five, four, three. Yes, it's a battery. Um, and so can you just see around there, there's a little bit of lucency? Excellent. So that, that's the end of my talk. I've lost the room. A little bit of a quiz and everyone goes excited. If anyone wants the playlist with all of those cases and all of the slides on it, if you go to bit.ly slash bubbles rad, you get the whole playlist. So you can look at all the cases, you can look at them um, all the actual complete cases rather than just the selected images that I showed today. Um, and yeah, we will be moving into this hospital in what, three weeks? Come on, it's been seven years in the making. Um, but it's very exciting. Anyway, that is me. Radiology is awesome.